Hello, I'm Earl Weinberg, and welcome to Book Circle Presents. This time we're going to continue reading Tales of the Dogda, and we're going to continue Oak and Rowan. The Dogda's room at the Fern Cleft had all the appointments of a modern luxury hotel suite, down to and including the chocolate mint on the pillow. But what he liked best about it was the fireplace. A great bronze cauldron sat there now, a cubit wide, distributing a savory smell. The flames under it took some explaining, since there was no wood. The nearest wood was the walking stick, now a leg-long piece of roughly worked oak timber leaning against the wall. The Dogda sat cross-legged on the floor, at ease in a bathrobe, working with the rowan wood he had gathered. The wood before him looked something like basket work, something like a skeleton, and most like the form of a small child rendered in woven twigs on a frame of sticks. From time to time he glanced at the flames around the cauldron, where he glimpsed views of Niles pulled from his memory and held in the air before him. From time to time he held out a branchy twig and leaf sphered rose on his pommel and trimmed it. Brian paced nervously about the room. He'd learned to feel magic and could tell some very major stuff was going down. That was edgy enough, but his moral qualms about it made things worse. He'd started as a wolfhound, but then turned man to dull the smell of fresh cut wood. That smell was changing into something more human. He continued his pacing, sometimes retreating from the work, sometimes coming into the Dogda's side to look at the forming thing in anxious curiosity. The Dogda had no objection to nudity in general, but said, Son, when I'm working here on the floor, I'd rather not have your particulars flapping about at face level. Put something on or lie down. Brian sat down before the fire in a crumple of long limbs and stared mournfully at the Dogda at his work. He might just as well have still been a dog, the guilt rays were so intense. The Dogda absorbed them for a while, then said, It's not going to explode, son. It's not even going to wake up. What will it do, sir? Brian asked. It will seem. It will look like the boy. It will seem to sleep. It will not wake. Then it will seem to ail and die. It will take a day or two. Then it will stand up to whatever the doctors do. In a couple of months, once it's safely buried, the spell will run its course and it will turn back into sticks. Brian nodded, but continued to look mournful. The Morrigan entered, followed by Sandy and the Ravens, and, to the Dogda's mild surprise, Mina. She had changed her Gibson girl gown for a sari of the lightest pastels and a spectrum from violet shoulder to pink hem. Changeling rescues, she asked. That's right, darling. And if you saw the lad, you'd see why I took to him. Mina nodded. And you took Sandy's advice on bringing a nanny in with him. Very practical and humane. Glad you'd approve. What state did you leave her in, darling? He asked of his other darling, the Morrigan. I laid out the plan for her and showed her a few tricks to prove we are what we say, then left her to make up her mind. She has two decisions. First, she decides if she's crazy or not. I think she'll decide not. Then she has to decide to come or not. Can't tell on that one. I think, dear, said Mina, he wants to know her emotional state. Stunned, of course, neither of you can have any idea how you strike mortals. The Dogda grunted his concession. Well, you're a resilient lot, he beamed at Mina. That's one of your charms. I think this is about ready. He looked critically at the stock. There was respectful silence while he concentrated. Then he blew on it. A mist, as of breath on a frosty morning, spread over it, thickened, turned to the hue of pale flesh, and formed into the shape of a little boy. The Dogda blew again in its face, and it began to breathe. Very sweet, Mina said politely, now that she could see what the child looked like. And a game little chap and hungry for love, the Dogda said. Jammies, Mina said. Brian, toss me a towel from the bathroom. When she had it, she gave it a shake and handed what was now a one-piece pajama of white terry cloth to the Dogda. She then knelt and helped him put it on the stock. Remember to swap it for his own jammies when you make the switch, she told him. We'll see about real clothes when we have him back here. The Dogda smiled. He said to her, Are you sure you don't want another century? She smiled back. Maybe, but not the one coming up. Right now I want my realm. Your own fault, dear. You taught me restlessness along with much else.
The hotel can lend us a car, she said, a nice big one. Not as strange as riding off through the night with the boy on Sandy's saddle bow as if you were the Earl King, less chancy than being invisible in traffic, and it'll be big enough for all of us. Us? You want to come? I do. Dinah opened to the dog does knock. He grinned warmly, but she just looked scared. You must be Dinah, he said. I'm the Dogda, and this... He had his suit jacket slung over his right shoulder cape-wise. He lifted it with his left hand, revealing what nestled in his arm. This is not Niles. Dinah whipped her head around to check the fold-out bed where the real Niles slept. She turned back to the Dogda, met his eyes, then stepped back and said formally, Enter freely and of your own will. The Dogda, who had read Dracula the year it came out, arched his brows but entered. The Morrigan and Mina followed him and the ravens fluttered after. Dinah went immediately to the bed and picked up Niles, who did not wake. She was not going to lose track of the real Niles. The Dogda lay the stock down where Niles had been. Do we have a deal? he asked. I... we may have. I tried to think it all through. I did what you said, this to the Morrigan, and realized this had to be real. So then, so then I decided I couldn't stand not knowing, not going. There's Niles, and there's... I couldn't let something like this walk into my life, then walk out again as if nothing had happened. Live knowing I didn't... You were right about the four choices, she turned to the Dogda. There's one thing. Can I keep in touch with my family? Visit or phone or write? I won't disappear and come back a hundred years later? Of course you can see your family, the Dogda said. We'll need to be a bit discreet, but that's all. The business of losing a century doesn't happen if you take a little care, said Mina. The Dogda was again dressed for a Tweedy country stroll, but she was dressed as for a cocktail party, in a silken black suit, her platinum hair spilling across her shoulders, the black gown glittering with silver necklace, belt, and bracelets. Ah, yes, said the Dogda. This is Mina Shea, shall we say. Mina Shea. She has lately been my wife. Mina offered a hand, which Dinah shook timidly. Where's the horse guy? Dinah asked. Sandy, he's downstairs in the car with Brian. Brian's the dog guy. Dog? You'll see. Do we have a deal? Dinah squared her shoulders, stared briefly into infinity, then held out her hand and said, Deal. They shook. Jammies, said Mina. Right, the Dogda answered. I'll just... He started to gesture at the stock, then stopped. No. Dinah, please switch the pajamas between Niles and his image there. Mina smiled at him. Dinah became grateful as she went through the task. As she peeled off Niles' pajamas, grubby blue cotton, and the stocks, white terry cloth, the differences became obvious. The real Niles grumbled in his sleep and flopped and wore a diaper. The stock was completely inert and was naked under the cloth. She slipped a diaper onto it. Task done, she retreated from the bed, hugging Niles, who was now awake about one part in four. A favorite toy, perhaps? Mina suggested. The teddy bear, said Nina, pointing at the edge of the bed. Munin retrieved it. Meanwhile, the dog just stepped into the bathroom and emerged with a yellow hand towel. He mushed it about in his hands and brought forth an imitation teddy bear, which he lay next to the imitation child. It'll unfold in a few days when no one's looking, he explained to Dinah. He beamed. Now we're off. Now, broke in Mina, we set up Dinah's cover story. The hotel car drove through the night, Sandy at the wheel. It made a nice change from being the vehicle. Behind him, in the passenger seats, Dinah still hugged Niles in clean contravention of the laws about strapping small children in carriers, but no one else was strapped in either. May I hold him now? The doctor asked, after what he considered a great deal of patience. When Dinah looked doubtful, he added, I am his father now, or I will be. You'll see me swear to it later this morning. Their eyes met, and he watched realization flit behind her gaze. King of the Irish fairies, turns men into beasts and back, has a war goddess for a daughter, makes fake children is asking nicely. She nodded and handed him the sleeping boy. 
The doctor sighed in satisfaction. Well, son, here we are again. Or it's again for me. All new for you. A welcome return for me. His smile was gentle. How many children do you have, uh, sire? Dinah asked. It was the first time she had addressed him of her own initiative. Oh, 200, 250. Mina would know the exact number. But I can tell you the name of each one. Some of my body, some adopted like Niles here. And there are the fosterlings and the godchildren. And I know their names and their birthdays and their mother's names and the names of their children and their children and the men and women they had them by. The recitation was a sort of proud croon with eyes closed as he walked Niles. You really love family, Dinah observed. Uh, sire, uh, your majesty. Morgan snorted faintly. The dog opened his eyes and met Dinah's again. Sir, is fine when you think to use it, he told her. Or Dogda, what do you call your own father? Uh, dad, daddy, when I was little. Every man ever called Dad or Daddy or Da or Dada is called after me, he declared, the pride glowing in the word. I'm the source and font of the name. Yes, I love my family. Father of gods and men, Dinah muttered, then realized she'd said it out loud without meaning to. Oops. That was Zeus, the Dagda answered peacefully enough. Poor old bastard. I'm nothing like so powerful. I and I took down my god shingle a long time back, but I like to think I've a little more class than him. I just... Uh, she stammered. I was researching you on the web, she offered an explanation. One site said you were, uh, the male fertility principle. The dogdo laughed. The Morrigan actually giggled and asked, Did you see the picture? The big drawing on the hillside? The, the, the one with the big, big club? Dinah stammered. The dog had chuckled down in his chest, so deep and dirty, Dinah fancied she could smell the testosterone on his breath. I don't think you were going to say club, he remarked. You mustn't believe publicity pictures. It's true I'm a philoprogenitive fellow, to use the posh word, but I'm a person, not an idea pretending to be a person. We'll be at the hotel, and you can take a couple of hours sleep, but you'll want to be up at dawn to see me claim him. Nina said to use her room. Do you want Niles with you tonight? Uh, sure. Tonight? Where will he be after that? With me, said the doctor, as if it were self-evident. Cultural differences, she told herself. Cultural differences. She tried to keep her face blank, but evidently did a poor job of it. Brian, who had been silent the whole ride and did not strike her as the most penetrating mind in the car, now said, I slept with my folks all in one bed as a youngster. Five or six kids, croaked Munin, dependent on how many were alive at the time, and both parents on a blanket over a bed of hay. Straw, corrected Brian. We'd have given any hay to the cow. That would be Ireland around 1740, added Hugin. It's just, Dinah said slowly, that's not the kind of arrangement I associated with a household with nannies. No, the Morrigan said conversationally. You are now worrying about how to protect Niles from the people you have helped kidnap him. And it's occurring to you a little late that while his mother may be the devil you know, we may be the devils you don't. Dinah's face was an enigmatic mask now, not that this helped. Do you read minds, she said, only from certain specific angles. The dog sighed. Yes, well, this is why I offered him to you for tonight. You don't know us. Soon enough you'll know what vows mean among us, and tomorrow you'll see me swear to be a father to the boy. Here and now, if you want, I will swear an oath that I am not that kind of monster. Dinah sat up straight and met his gaze once more, only harder. Yes, do it. The doctor's smile was grim this time, but it was a smile. I told you she was brave, the Morrigan said.
Jessica came teetering in on her red shoes from a party that rated three out of ten, in her opinion. She halted at the sight of a stranger sitting at the breakfast table, a young Middle Eastern woman in black hijab and blouse, blue jeans and sneakers. She looked up from her phone with an annoyed expression. Who are you? Jessica demanded. I'm a friend of Dinah's, was the answer. The English was perfect, even high-toned. She couldn't stay, so she asked me to babysit your kid. Job interview. In the middle of the night, past middle by now, but she has to get there by morning, came out of the blue. Here, she left you this. The friend passed Jessica an envelope. Inside was a handwritten letter from Dinah explaining, with emphasis, that she was not coming back, except maybe to pick up some clothes and stuff, and Jessica would have to look after herself and her own child without Dinah's help. Dinah then wrote that Jessica ought to give up Niles to the child care people, even if it gave a hit to her dole, because she was obviously an unfit mother. Dinah waxed eloquent on this. In fact, she had rehearsed mentally for months months before the doctor came along. As it was, she thought Niles was too quiet and might be sickening for something, so Jessica, for a change, would have to take him to the doctor. Jessica gave a snort and tossed the letter on the fold-out bed where it appeared that Niles was sleeping. Fine. Message delivered. You can go now. The friend rose silently and left. Jessica mentally tabled her problems, went to her room, kicked off shoes, stripped to underwear, and flopped. At least the kid was being quiet. Out in the hall, Mina melted the hijab blouse and jeans back into her silk gown, shook the glamour off her hair and face, and descended the stairs. A shape rolled out of the alley where Sandy had lurked a few hours before. Leaf Sverd, as Weir Cycle, in rather more shadow than even the poor lighting, explained. How fares the plan, lady? he asked, his voice a softer chiming than on the forest path. The shadows fell from him as she got on. All done, she said cheerfully. A slit of light opened in the headlamp, then widened until the lamp shone white around a blazing blue center. Nina felt the seat rise a bit as the tires tensed. There was a pause. Pray, lady, lay hold the handlebars, the weir cycle suggested. Oh, you can steer. This, she was not as commanding as the Morrigan. She did not want to be. Why, thanks, lady, but still use them to hold on. Ah, right. They were as warm as a man's hands. They rolled off into the night, fluttering and glittering, but with no sound beside the soft hiss of leather tires on the road, and they attracted no notice. Dinah stepped gingerly off the hotel patio onto the lawn. She was not used to walking around barefoot outdoors, nor was she used to getting up before the early summer dawn, or used to her costume. It was the only thing she wore, a linen garment like an over-large, over-long t-shirt with a broad linen strip for a belt. The Dogda wore the same, as did all the rest of his well, what to call it, his entourage, his court, his household, whatever it was, she was part of it now. She decided she liked household best, and it included the horse and dog guys, Mina, the Morrigan, and certainly Niles. It probably included the two ravens, though they wore only their feathers, and maybe even the sword riding in the scabbard on the Morrigan's back. It had hopped in there on her command as she left her room, and she had called it by name. They were all trailing out across the hotel's garden lawn to a footpath beside the little brook that supplied the fish pond. Behind them, in street clothes, came the innkeepers and several other members of the hotel staff. The more witnesses, the better, the Dogda had proclaimed, and it invited everyone within earshot of the lobby. The footpath was graveled. For the sake of her shoe-soft feet, she kept to the lawn, trailing just behind the Dogda, who carried Niles on his shoulders. It had taken a bit of nerve to push herself ahead of the Morrigan and the others, but damn it, Niles was her job. No one had seemed to mind. The footpath led between a pair of rosebush mazes, then gave out. 
the party continued along the stream. The lawn gave out. For a little, there was mossy streamside and tended-looking trees. No bracken, no low branches, just a layer of leaves. Then they started up a gentle slope, and it was just woods. They stopped by a big rock overhung by a tall, slender tree. Its leaves grew in orderly, feathery clusters. It occurred to Dinah that she had seen trees like that all her life, but knew nothing about them. The dog to put Niles down, then hunkered down to the boy's level. He smiled and spread his arms as he had in the park. Niles smiled back, spread his arms and turned, and closed in for the hug. Now, son, the dog to said, I'm going to be your daddy, and Dinah here will be your nanny. That means she and I will be here to keep you company and help take care of you. Do you like that? A little bewildered, Niles nodded. The dog to put one hand on his heart and the other on Niles' heart. I swear by my life and my hope and my power that I will be your father from now on. Tina blinked. The pre-dawn sky was totally clear, yet she had heard thunder. No, she hadn't, but she felt that she remembered hearing it. And the dog, does, she noted, now looked tired for the first time in her acquaintance of him. But he smiled. He brought Niles in for another hug and kissed him on the cheek. Then he rumpled the boy's hair and laughed. It was as if his hand had been coated in ink. Niles' hair changed from blonde to black under his touch, just as black as the dog his own hair. Well, I didn't expect that. A good sign. Was it? N Dinah felt around under her shock, trying to decide what she thought of this change. She remembered how the Morrigan had promised most solemnly that Niles would live to see the moon fall out of the sky. What other bigger changes were going on here? The Dogda said to the boy, Now, about names. People call me the Dogda. You can call me Da, because I'm your daddy now. My name is Darak, means oak. He pointed into the woods at a handy young oak. Now, I'm going to give you a new name. Dinah suddenly felt she was on firm ground with something to say. Good. Do you know where Jessica got Niles? She told me, from Mill and Nihilism and like that. She literally named him nothing. Well, that's over, the dog announced. He pointed to the feather-leafed tree and said to the boy, See this tree? It's a rowan. In spring it looks like this. He waved a hand, and suddenly the tree was decked with tight clusters of starry white flowers. And in fall it looks like this. The flowers were replaced with clusters of bright red berries. Pretty, pretty tree, isn't it? And its wood is good for good magic. Your name is Carathon now, means Rowan. You can use Rowan for a nickname if you like. Now, there's someone I want you to meet. He stood and led the way further up the stream. The boy, Carathon, Rowan held tight to his arm, as he had held tight to an uninterested arm yesterday. But this arm gathered him up and tucked him into the crook of its elbow. The dog did not look tired at all now. He looked eager. The way up the bank of the brook grew steeper and rockier. The brook grew narrower and faster. The woods gave way to bracken, then heather. Near the top of the hill stood a heap of great boulders the size of a small house. The stream came trickling out from among the stones. The dog to put Rowan on his shoulders and addressed the stones or the stream. Mother, here is your newest grandchild. Carathon, meet your granny. The stream swelled and surged, then water erupted from the stones, a fountain, a geyser, drenching everyone. The dog to laughed, so did Mina and even the Morgan. Rowan shrieked. Glee? Surprise? Or fear? Dinah wasn't sure. He shrieked again. She was still not sure, but was getting worried. Would the dog to know? How could she know what he knew? She had to assume he knew no more than a mortal man, and with Rowan on his shoulders, he could not see the boy's expression. She was already in a downpour. She stepped into what amounted to a waterfall and lifted the boy off the off his father's shoulders. She held him in front of her, at arm's length, grinning determinedly. See? This is fun! Honest! She began a sidestepping circle, making a dance of ring around Rosie. Rowan was almost invisible in the torrent of water, but she was sure he smiled. Now she could hear his laughter. 
A warm hand clasped her shoulder and she saw another clasp Rowan's, the dog that was joining in the dance, embracing them both, grinning. Oh good, she wouldn't be fired or turned into a frog or anything. She became aware of more figures in the dance, a wider ring around them, three women with joined hands. They were made of water, the downpouring streams sculpting into evanescent female forms. Was this Granny? For just a moment, the downpour became no less than a vertical river. In the roaring, she heard a woman's laughter, and then it stopped. They stood on the hill, by the stones, in the sun. The stream was fast returning to normal, and everyone was, of course, drenched. Rowan held out his arms to the Dagda. Dinah gave him back. He wasn't scared, the Dagda told her, but it was all thought of. He popped Rowan back on his shoulders and began marching down the hill through the wet grass and the wet hotel staff. They were all smiling in a mask-like way. They were not, after all, dressed for the occasion. Perhaps the dog to realize this. He waved one hand and immediately a light summer breeze came up the hill. Within a few seconds, people began drying. On the same principle she had observed before, that a nanny's place was with her charge, Dinah started to hurry after father and son, but she found Nina at her side at a deliberately slower pace. Even soaking wet, she only looked charmingly disheveled. Dinah, Dinah felt sure she herself looked like something pulled out of a drain. Let him monopolize the boy for a while, Mina advised. He does not want to be an absentee kind of father, I guarantee it. Dinah nodded and paced beside Mina. Where do we go now, she asked. Back to the hotel. I mean, I mean after that, when we go home. Where is home? You have jumped in at the deep end, haven't you? There are several places it could be. All will be beautiful. All will be strange. You'll be safe in any of them. He'll see to that. But I don't think we'll be leaving any time soon. He hasn't done what he came for. Didn't he come for, for Rowan? No, I, uh, there, it'll take us a while. Rowan was a happy accident. No, he came here on a bride hunt. Bride hunt? I thought you were his wife. Ex-wife, dear, for these last few years. He asked me to come and give him a good character, a reference. Who better? Let me explain. It is about children, because you see, Faze can't have them among themselves, or only rarely. The Morrigan said something like that when she showed up at my flat. Quite right. Odd to think she's now his big sister. But they, Faze, can have children with mortals quite normally, at least if the Faze are human. And he is, Dinah asked, nodding ahead at the doctor. Every bit as human as he looks, at the moment. It's his preferred species. And while he'll love Rowan quite as much as any of his other children, he wants children of his body, too. So he takes mortal women to be the mothers. Takes? I'm sorry, I didn't mean it in any bad way. That is, there have never been any complaints, not from the women, not at the start of the relationship. But he's very old, you realize? Dinah nodded. So he's had to change his ways many times. These days he offers marriage. If monogamy is what's wanted, that's what he'll give, a century of it, with the aim of having children. Wait, excuse me, you were married to him for a hundred years? Mina nodded. Are you mortal? Mortal? I was, Mina smiled and spread her arms, presenting herself. Mina Shea, Nee Dalloway, born 1864 in Oxfordshire. We met in London at the Diamond Jubilee. He was there to make mischief. He wasn't at all fond of England at that time. But the Crystal Palace survived. We had a whirlwind courtship, as you'd guess, and then off to Tiernan Og. To have children? Four of them, yes. Mina studied Dinah's face, then said, I don't want to make it sound too agricultural. He didn't just want me to have babies for him. He wanted a partner, a friend, with whom to have a family. It's rather pre-romantic, but it's a sound enough basis for a marriage. So you see, I do give him a good character. Drifting into happy memory, she stared off into the cloudless morning sky, which nevertheless had a rainbow in the west over the forest, presumably thanks to Granny and all the water she had flung about. 
There was raising them and seeing them launched on their own lives and the two fosterlings and a changeling rescued for some unseely and just miscellaneous adventures. And lately we've been arranging the bride price. Bride price? What I get. Well, what I get besides becoming an immortal fairy queen, mother to fairy princes and princesses, and over 150 years without a dull moment. You get your own realm, a little one, but you get to arrange it and develop it. But he cast you aside when it's time to get a new wife? My dear, not cast aside. We will be friends and allies for, uh, for always, I trust. He said the sweetest thing to me last evening. He asked if I wanted another century of marriage. I said maybe later. Remember what I said about never a dull moment? You come to treasure dull moments eventually. Dinah walked a few paces in thoughtful silence. Then, are you trying to sell this deal to me? Now that you mention it, of course he gets a say too. He'll want your friendship. But he already knows you to be sensible and brave, and there's one child at least that you both love. She gestured ahead, where Rowan was now visible in the distance, bobbing on his daddy's shoulders. A very good beginning, she said, smiling on Dinah, who was blushing from the compliments. I should say that if you want him, you can have him. Thank you.